Welcome back to another Tabletop Review. Today we'll be taking a look at rebluing, Steps, Tips, and Tricks. Last month I did a review of this Stevens Model 87A 22 rifle. It's a 70 year old Farm 22 rifle that's been used frequently but pretty much neglected in terms of cleaning and oiling. I was asked to clean it up a bit if I could. Here it is today. And by the magic of video editing, here it is before. Pretty rough. It may be hard to believe it's the same gun. I assure you it is. During that review I went through the restoration process, but I've been asked if I could do just a video on restoration itself. Covering more on the steps I went through and providing suggestions for someone who's never attempted a bluing project before. I know there are some people who have a firearm that needs a little finish repair, but they're a bit nervous about attacking the job themselves. I certainly understand that, especially the concerns about damaging the gun further, because you don't know what you're doing. In fact, this would actually be the second video I've done on rebluing. The first was about a year ago on the Smith & Wesson Model 422. But here, I'll give more attention to the process. Now let's make sure this gun is cleared first, and by the way, if you enjoyed this review, be sure to like, share, and subscribe. I've restored probably more than a dozen firearms over the last three years. I can't tell you that they all look like new now, but I can say every one of them looks better than it did. Here are a few examples. And I'll admit that each time I began stripping or sanding on a gun, I had butterflies in my stomach. Was I making things worse? Will it turn out okay? And there's good cause for that anxiety. If the project requires significant disassembly, will you be able to reassemble the gun? The quality of bluing is dependent on the quality of the carbon steel, in my opinion. So how good is the steel on this gun? I've seen brownish and blotchy results. I suggest you check by trying out a small area that can't be seen first such as under the grips or the stock. True, it does take a bit of courage and patience, but not as much as you might think. In fact, I recommend focusing on preparation and the process, and try not to think too much about what could go wrong. Otherwise, you'll never start. Now that being said, you should know that a re-blued part will usually not look as black or the same as a factory blued job. Cold blowing, which is what I'm covering here, is a different process. I tell people to expect more of a dark charcoal result rather than black. But in every one of my cases the factory bluing was already too far gone to really worry about. And let me add that I've never had a complaint regarding the outcome on a rebluing project. Do it right, which will take a little effort, but not hard at all, and I think you'll be pleased as well. Now if this is new for you, try rebluing something you've got that's not worth a lot an old open-end wrench or old screwdriver, anything that's made of carbon steel. Aluminum, brass, and stainless steel will not blue. Frankly, I see old firearms in need of restoration at gun shows all the time. Many are just junk, but picking up a cheap old rifle or revolver for 50 bucks or less could provide the perfect learning tool. Rust and pitting can be great because it's easier to negotiate a good price and it will provide you with a good challenge for restoration. And given how little you've got in the gun, allows you to relax and even take a risk. You can focus on developing your skills. I actually have a couple of guns myself that I got for next to nothing and brought back enough to warrant further investing in their full restoration. Now at the moment I don't have a gun to restore, but I do have a piece of scrap metal here that I'll be using for demonstrations. It's got rust and pitting, which should provide a good example. Let's begin with taking another look at this rifle before I did any work on it. This Stevens Model 87A is a good example of what I was talking about when I said you could find project guns for $50 or less. This gun wasn't working when I got it and according to market, given its condition, it was only worth about $50 assuming it was working. The barrel and loading tube and receiver looked really rough. Lots of pitting and rust. But look at it now. With the right material and effort, you can get pretty good results. By the way, the trigger guard just took a little sanding and black enamel spray paint. The 
the stock took a little sanding and three coats of clear satin polyurethane. The black end on the forend on this rifle is the way the original gun was detailed. Restoring the stock or grip is usually no big deal. It's the bluing that really makes the difference. But you must admit the total effect here is actually pretty good. First it's important to get organized. Find a place to work that's got good lighting, good ventilation, and a good working surface. I'll tell you that bluing can be a really messy process, so no matter how you try to keep things clean, it seems to get everywhere, especially during the sanding stage. So be prepared for that. I try to cover areas with rags, old newspapers, or plastic trash bags. That goes for clothing as well. Second, make sure you've got all your supplies ready. I've had good luck with Birchwood Super Blue and Birchwood Perma Blue. They work the same, but there are other products out there that work just as well. I've also used Birchwood Blue and Rust Remover. I've used alcohol as well as Birchwood Cleaner Degreaser. Either will work just fine in my opinion. And by the way, these little containers will go a long ways. Even use Liberty one bottle of bluing, for example, has lasted for years and many projects, big and small. I've used Q-tips, I've used cloth patches, and I've used small sections of rags, depending on the project. If the project is small, Q-tips seem to work just fine. I go through a lot of paper towels. I've also got tons of old t-shirt rags. I've got old yogurt cups to hold water, and I've got a lot of disposable surgical style gloves. I also have some rubber work gloves for heavy duty stuff. I've got a plastic container with a lid for small parts and I've got a few picks and screwdrivers ready. I've got a brass brush and of course here are my safety glasses. I also have magnifying glasses that I found very helpful. You can pick these up at a drugstore pretty cheap. I've even got a wastebasket ready. Some people like to heat the parts before blowing. I've got a paint stripping heater here for that, but a hair dryer will do. But to be honest, I've gotten good results without heating so far. It is, after all, cold bluing. Now for the sandpaper. I liked an assortment of wet and dry sandpaper. 80 grit, 120, 220, 320, 400, 800, and 3000 grit. I always use the sandpaper wet. The paper grit seems to last longer and do a better job when wet in my opinion. I just dip my fingers in the water and wet the paper a little. If water is running off the project while you're working, you're using too much water. Then I have triple aught steel wool as well as the 0000 ultra fine steel wool. For flat surfaces, a sanding block or rubber sanding pad can be helpful. For round or contoured surfaces, your fingers will be just fine. For most jobs, these supplies will provide all that I'll need to prepare a surface for bluing. Finally, I have a can of spray oil that I'll use to seal the bluing as a last step in the process. I should mention that what we're doing here is not recommended for valuable heirloom firearms. See a professional in that situation. And what if the rust is light or in just a small localized area? Well, if it's just a small spot or the rust is light, and I need to preserve the bluing, I'll try a little gun oil or WD-40 and 0000 steel wool. But these projects were way beyond that. By the way, what about chemical rust removers? Sure, I like evaporust. It works. And I've had good luck with Loctite Rust Dissolver. Of course, you can always get complicated with electrolysis. No doubt you can spend a lot on liquid rust removers you'll find on the shelves at AutoZone and Home Depot, etc. But my favorite is just plain household strength distilled white vinegar. I like it because it's real cheap, easy to come by, and perfectly safe to work with. A 2 hour to 24 hour soak in a bath of vinegar will loosen up, if not totally remove, most rust on steel. Neutralize with water with a little dish soap, and then after rinsing again with clean water, I'll use a brass or steel brush or fine steel wool to finish up. Then I'll spray down with DW40 to displace moisture. We won't be doing that today, but it would be a good option if you just wanted to get rid of the rust or work on a small spot. In our case, I want to deal with the pitting too. Rust removal removes rust. 
for pitting, I'll be sanding. Many of the projects I've worked on have required complete disassembly of the firearm, such as this Smith & Wesson Model 59 and Smith & Wesson Model 422, but not all required that. This 22 rifle is a good example of when it would be too difficult and not really necessary. As long as the visible surfaces can be reached like the sights, you're probably good to go. And I have a few tricks I'll show regarding these areas. So in this case, simple field stripping and removal of the safety lever was basically all I did. If the surface isn't too bad, you can start with the cleaner degreaser and then the blue and rust remover. You'll use steel wool here to remove the old bluing. Just follow the instructions on the bottles. This is where I'll use a brass brush to get to the complex areas like these sites. But if the surface is really bad, I'll just go directly to sanding of the roughest areas. The rust and pitting was so extreme on this rifle that even though I started with the 220 grit paper, I had to go back to the coarser 80 grit in some areas of the receiver. I prefer to try a finer grit paper first, less sanding required to get rid of the sanding marks, but sometimes it can't be helped. By the way, you may see little pitting blotches that just don't seem to go away. Don't worry too much about these because I've found that the bluing process will cover these as long as the surface is smooth to the touch. Each progressively finer grip paper will remove the scratches left by the coarser paper until you've got a pretty smooth surface with 3000 grit sanding. Have patience and take your time. Finally using the triple aught or the 0000 steel wool and water will allow you to buff the surface till it's pretty smooth and ready for bluing. But go back to the cleaner degreaser one final time first before bluing. If the surface you want is satin or matted, stop the process when you've reached that level of sanding preparation for bluing. If you carefully check out the original surface, you'll note the machining mark directions, usually lengthwise on a slide for example. How deep are the machining marks? That's what you should try to replicate. Take close-up pictures before you begin so you'll have a reference if you need. Try a section to test results and don't be afraid to experiment with different outcomes until you're satisfied. And don't forget to address parts like levers, triggers, and uh, screw heads. So using my scrap piece here, let's go through the steps. We're going to begin with cleaner degreaser. I'm just going to use a patch here to apply. Following the directions, I'm using a paper towel soaked in water to wipe the area off. And another paper towel dry to wipe that off. Doesn't look like we made much progress. Now I'm going to use a patch with blue and rust remover and I'm going to let it sit for about two minutes. Again, following those directions. And we'll let it sit for a couple of minutes. Now I'm going to wipe off the area with uh, dampened steel wool. This will help remove any rust or bluing that remains. Of course, this part doesn't have any bluing, but you get the idea. Then I'm going to use some fresh clean water, wipe the area off, then a dry towel to wipe that water off. Well you can see it's getting a little better but still a, a lot of pitting. Now because of the pitting I've selected 120 grit dry wet sandpaper. If needed I can always repeat with a coarser grade like 80 grit. Wetting the paper first Let's see what we can do here. Now because this is a flat surface, I'm going to use a sanding block. It's going to take a lot more work. 
Now the surface is so pitted I decided to go to 80 grit here to kind of help things along a little quicker. Okay, I've been sanding with coarse 80 grit paper and made some progress, but the surface has the cut tooling marks that are fairly deep. This is just for demonstration purpose, so I'm not going to worry about them. I'm using paper towels here to keep the area clean enough to see how I'm doing. Now I'm just going to repeat with progressively finer grits of paper until I've got the surface I want. I'm wrapping up with fine steel wool. Now before I apply bluing, I'll clean and degrease one more time and rinse with clean water. Then dry the part off with a clean dry towel. Okay, we're ready for bluing. Cold bluing is basically a chemical reaction of an acid solution to carbon steel. It seems to me that the results I'll get depend on the quality of the steel, so results will differ depending on the project and even the parts. As for the steps, following the instructions of the Birchwood Super Blue or whatever you're using will usually give you good results. A couple of things I personally do differently are if the area is small, I'll continue to add solutions to the surface during the first application. And secondly, I'll usually leave the bluing on for more than just the recommended 30 seconds. I've gotten good even results just letting the bluing solution do its thing. As long as there's a reaction, I'll leave it working. This seems to be dependent on the metal. Reaction appeared to be complete in under 20 seconds on this Astra. However, the most dramatic example of this continued reaction was on the slide of this Smith & Wesson Model 422. That ended up taking more than 30 minutes on the first application. I could visibly watch the reaction continue beyond 15 minutes. Waiting 30 minutes probably wasn't necessary, but it didn't hurt. In most cases, a minute or less will suffice. On this Stevens rifle, each application took about 4 minutes. In the part that I'm working on, a minute and 15 seconds seem to work just fine. Then a little steel wool to buff the surface before the second application. And clean water on a towel. And a dry towel to wipe it off. buffing with steel wool. And we'll do a third application. And here's a wet towel to wipe it off. And a dry towel. steel wool to buff it, just lightly, and there it is. All that's left is to coat it with oil, and let it rest overnight to cure. You can wipe down the part to the next day and reassemble. 
keep a light surface oil on the blued parts for storage. So here's the rifle again fully assembled and with its painted trigger guard and polyurethane stock. Looks pretty good doesn't it? It may not be perfect but it certainly looks a heck of a lot better than it did. Not only have you given a gun a new finish, you provided some protection from further corrosion. You could also say that you developed some good skills and accomplished something that you can be proud of. If it didn't turn out as good as you'd hoped, the good news is that you can easily just start the whole process over again. Begin by removing the finish with birch wood blue and rust remover and repeat the preparation in the bluing steps. By the way, I've noticed that if newly blued parts are left in contact with an absorbent surface, like stored in a holster or laying on a rag or a cardboard box for any period of time immediately after bluing, the bluing may blotch at the points of contact. I recommend storing the gun in the open with as little contact to the blued areas as possible for the first couple of weeks to allow for the bluing to fully cure. Now, before we end today's video, I'd like to remind you if you haven't already, be sure to like, share, and subscribe down below. And thanks for watching, and I hope you found this video useful. The idea here was to provide you with some instruction, hints, and tricks for cold bluing. Hopefully you found some useful information to make your cold bluing project easier and more successful. I have found that 90% of the work required for a good result is in that preparation stage. Taking the time to prepare the surface will pay dividends with an attractive blued finish that should last well into the future. And if that finishes on a gun that's going to be your everyday carry weapon, all the more reason to be proud of your work. Any weapon you carry is better than the one you left at home. Thanks for watching and hope you'll be back for my next tabletop review. Until next time, stay safe.